Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. This is a webinar where we talk about Lyme disease. I look forward to seeing the questions you have because um, that sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about. And as many of you know that have participated in these webinars before, I use your question as a platform to discuss anything I want to talk about. <laughs> but usually it relates to your question. So I, I use the questions to actually explain things about Lyme disease. So I look forward to seeing what you have in store for me tonight. Um, the way that you can participate in this webinar, if you're new here, is there's a few ways. Number one, um, you can listen in and uh, see what kind of questions people have and how I answer them, okay? The other thing that you can do is actually write a question to me. And the way you do that is on the right-hand side of your screen at the bottom, there is a chat box that you can use uh, to write the question to me. The only thing I ask is that in this format, brief questions work better than long ones. And if they get too long, I just won't post them because um, or answer them because they're just too complicated to do in this kind of a format, okay? Um, and as you're writing your question, I request that you do not hit the enter key until the whole question is done. Uh, each time that you should happen to hit that enter key, it actually sends part of your question to me and then it gets really complicated on my side of the screen here to follow the different pieces of your question. Um, I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar, as I usually do, and uh, my intention is that by 9.30 a.m. Seattle time tomorrow, that that question will, or that the um, uh, email uh, saying that the uh, um, video is ready will come out to you, and I usually use, I, I will spend this evening doing some editing, and then uh, tomorrow morning I'll spend some time prior to sending it out, trying to summarize the different topics that we talked about in this. So if you miss something tonight, you, you'll be able to see it again. If you somehow do not get the email, um, the way that you can find a copy of this recording is you can go to a treatlime.net. That's my website, which is Treatline by Marty Ross MD. And if you go to the webinars page, you can see the video recording there, all right? So it always posts um, there after uh, the day after we do the recording. Also, in tomorrow's email, you'll be able to sign up for next week's webinar. And this is the first of three uh, April webinars that we're having here, okay? And that back there, that's Mr. Thor. That's my one of my Basinji dogs. And uh, hopefully he's not gonna... <laughs> Be moving around too much because otherwise he could be distracting. But um, and I have another one here under my desk named Halo. So those are my two Basinjis that I bring to work with me here. You may see them moving around uh, behind me there. Um, Thor Thor likes getting into some things here sometimes. So we'll we'll see if we see more of him tonight. All right, everyone. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that are participating here in the live version, you're actually going to be able to see the questions because um, they will show up on your screen. But if you're participating in the um, recorded version tomorrow or later, uh, I'm going to read the questions because they don't show up um, in the recorded version. All right. So this first question is from Gail. Hello, Gail. Hi, Dr. Ross. A few questions. My understanding is that rifampin and biaxin pose moderate risk when taken together, in particular affecting drug levels and potentially causing inflammation of the uvea. How is it possible that so many patients are on these two drugs concurrently? What are the risks and how can they be avoided? Is it better to take rifampin with azithromycin? Is that safer than biaxin? If not, how is it best to take the two antibiotics during the day? together, apart, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna answer that first question. So azithromycin and clarithromycin are part of a group of antibiotics called the macrolides. And they both are mixed with rifampin. In theory, um, the rifampin decreases, I always botch this one up. I'm gonna look it up. There, um, The rifampin, I believe, lowers the levels of biaxin, but hold on here, I'm gonna look that one up. So in theory, there is an alteration in effective drug levels when you use these two drugs together, when you combine it as rifampin and biaxin together. That's in theory, okay? I wanted to use the word in theory, all right? In reality, I rarely see any problem using the two together. I find effectiveness that even if there is some alteration in the drug levels, that you still have enough to get an effective treatment. So I don't, I don't, I use the two um, interchangeably, okay? 
All right, now let's see here. All right, Fampin. Bear with me, this thing, I, I wanna make sure which direction it goes. So hold on here. All right. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's why I was I was correct in thinking that. So it actually the rifampin decreases the levels of biaxin, or may decrease the levels of biaxins just a little bit. Now, decreases a little bit, that doesn't mean it's still not going to work. All right. So I find in my practice that I actually use them quite well in terms of, and have good benefit, and I don't do any increased amounts of clarithromycin when I mix it with rifampin. Okay. In terms of your concern about it um, causing inflammation of the uvea, I've never seen that happen. Um, I and I use a lot of this these two in combination with each other. Okay, um, all right. Number two, do you ever use liposomal doxycycline? What is the potential advantages over regular doxycycline? Is it easier on the stomach lining? All right. So this is a current um, trend. <laughs> without any substantiation at this point as to whether it's going to make a difference. And that is some doctors are starting to use, quote unquote, liposomal varieties of um, antibiotics. Now, I want to talk about the word liposomal and what it should mean, but how it's being misappropriated. So liposomal technically means that we take a medicine, a drug, and we microscopically wrap it in a layer of fat to improve its absorption into the bloodstream through the intestinal tract, okay? So that's what it's supposed to mean. However, there are a number of uh, companies that have co-opted the, the term liposomal, and basically what they do is they take a drug and they mix it in oil, and they call that liposomal, all right? So the drug is just mixed in to the oil, but it's not microscopically wrapped in a bubble of the oil. Um, liposomal technically should mean microscopically wrapped in a bubble of the oil, all right? Now, as to whether true liposomal doxycycline or liposomal doxycycline that really is just doxycycline mixed in with fat increases the absorption, who knows? <laughs> we have no studies done proving it. So uh, I, I know people are doing this, but I, I, I'm skeptical it's going to make that it makes any difference, okay? All right, number three. Have you ever used DMSO for bursitis? If so, how is it best applied? Is it safe? I have shoulder bursitis and PT isn't working and I can't do steroid injections due to Lyme. Thank you. So um, I haven't, in terms, DMSO, everyone is a substance that's actually used in veterinary medicine, actually in horses, for instance, um, and has some anti-inflammatory properties. And um, I have never used, it's an interesting question, Gail, because I haven't used it on any one of my Lyme patients that have bursitis or shoulder pain or muscle pains. Uh, prior to starting to focus my practice on Lyme disease, I actually am a, trained as a family physician. And uh, back in between 2000, 2004, before I started really focusing more on managing uh, the treatment of chronic Lyme disease, I ran a primary care integrated medicine practice. So I used a lot of alternative medicines and treatment modalities to handle regular primary care problems like shoulder pain. And um, I did use DMSO with a number of my patients back then that had just garden variety strains of, of different uh, organ or of uh, muscles and tendons and ligaments, and I found it to be useful. Um, I can't tell you as to whether it would do anything for somebody with Lyme and the type of inflammation though, no. okay? All right, so yes, it is safe. I'm just not sure if it um, is effective. And I, I think, we, I, boy, it's been a long time since I've used it. I think it's applied twice a day, uh, but I don't hold me to that. I just haven't used it in a long time. I'd have to look it back up and see how to do it again, okay? All right, thanks, Gail, good luck to you. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Dr. Ross. 
My father, who is almost 80 years old and has lots of health issues, including Epstein-Barr and mold toxicity, got the first COVID vaccine on March 24th and has been feeling terrible ever since. If he starts taking activated charcoal immediately, do you think that could cause him to feel better? Um, also, he is scheduled to have the second shot next week. Should he go through with it? I'm worried it will make him feel even worse. What are your thoughts? Thank you. So first of all, um, I um, this is one of those things I, I, your uncle should, or your father um, should talk to his doctor. Um, I, I'm not gonna be able to give out medical advice about the vaccine because there's a lot uh, in this kind of a situation. He needs to actually get medical advice from his physician who can review with him what's happened there's also a number of questions I would need to ask to figure out, is this all just exclusively a reaction to the vaccine or is there something else that went on? And I, I can't do that in this kind of a format. So unfortunately, Catherine, I'm going to have to decline to answer this other than to say, I don't think charcoal will make a difference here. Um, if he is flared up from the vaccine, it is likely because it triggered a lot of cytokines. Charcoal doesn't bind cytokines. Um, charcoal may bind toxins in the intestines to prevent them from getting absorbed because toxins sometimes can trigger cytokines, but charcoal itself doesn't bind cytokines. If he's got a cytokine surge, it's not because of toxins here, okay? And um, things that, uh, so I, I would just say that I don't think the charcoal is going to make a difference for him, all right? I, he should be talking to his physician to find out um, ideas on what to do. All right. Thanks for that question, Catherine. Hello, Thomas. Let's see. Treatment for internal neurologic tremors. Um, all right. So first of all, so when somebody, so tremors or internal, by internal, I think what you mean is it's more of a feeling or a sensation. You feel like you're vibrating or tremoring rather than actually being able to see it on the outside. Um, in my experience, I have found that this happens primarily when Bartonella is there. Okay. Uh, now, just having it does not mean you have Bartonella, but I have found it as part of Bartonella. So first of all, try to figure out, do you have Bartonella? Um, and if you do, then you should be treating for that. So things that make me wonder about Bartonella symptom-wise would be pain on the balls of the feet, um, having a lot of um, psychiatric concerns like anxiety, depression, severe cognitive impairments, severe thinking problems make you wonder about Bartonella. Um, also, neurologic syndromes like tremors, like seizures, um, like internal tremors and buzzing, like you're describing, make you think of Bartonella. And then um, also um, having a um, uh, rash that looks like stretch or scratch marks makes you think of Bartonella. And occasionally Bartonella can actually give air hunger. Um, although a lot of times people attribute uh, air hunger more to Babesia co-infection, it sometimes can occur with Bartonella. And that's because Bartonella uh, can infect the cells that line the inside of your blood vessels and when those cells get infected, they sometimes swell up and they uh, block the flow of blood or limit the flow of blood, leading to a feeling of not getting enough oxygen or air hunger. OK, um, let's see. So what do you do about that? Well, number one, see if Bartonella is there. And if it is, treat it. OK, number two, sometimes herbally, what I have found to be helpful is to use an herb called L-theanine. So that's L-theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E, -E, okay? So theanine is a component of green tea. And in the brain, or it gets absorbed, and in the brain, it binds to, or it's converted into a chemical called GABA. And GABA binds to what are known as benzodiazepine GABA receptors, which is the uh, anti-seizure medicine receptor, if you will, okay? All right. Um, also, it has the effect of decreasing the amplitude of electrical nerve wave transmission in the brain, too. So it calms agitation. And the way that I like using it comes as a 100 milligram pill. And I, I suggest that people, when they have this problem, use it as a start at one pill three times a day. You can work all the way up even to three pills three times a day. Um, be aware, though, it may make you a little sleepy. 
Um, so you got to find a dose you can tolerate that still helps you, basically. Okay. All right. So that's L-theanine and consider treating for Bartonella if you have Bartonella. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Thomas. Hello, Lawrence. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. What do you make of BEG nasal spray for treating mold toxins detected in nasal cavity, cavities slash positive markons? Is the spray affected by itself or does it need to be used in conjunction with binders? Also, is throbbing of extremities typical for Lyme and co-infections? If so, is the best way to address that via all typical strategy for reducing inflammation? Thanks. All right. So, Let's talk about beg nose spray and Marcons and mold toxicity and um, and whether it makes any sense to do this or not, okay? So to do that, I wanna talk about Dr. Richie Shoemaker and his theories, and then I wanna talk about the real world. <laughs> so as you can already tell, I'm not so big on some of Dr. Shoemaker's theories, okay? So Dr. Shoemaker is the uh, physician that first described mold toxin illness, and I, I attribute that to him. I think he did a great job in coming up and noting and figuring out that there was such a problem. Um, and so in Dr. Shoemaker's, and there are a lot of physicians now that have trained with Dr. Shoemaker, but keep in mind, Dr. Shoemaker is not recognized chronic Lyme disease. All right, so let me, and I'll come back to that point in a minute why I just made that point. So um, Dr. Shoemaker um, has been able to show that 25% of all people when they breathe mold toxins in, are not able to remove them from their bloodstream, okay? 75% of us are able to remove those mold toxins. And Dr. Shoemaker was able to show that there is a genetic predisposition that sets it up so that you might have the problem, okay? Did you hear that word might, okay? So what Dr. Shoemaker suggests is that everyone gets a test called an HLA-DR test. And if it is abnormal, that means you have a genetic predisposition that might make it difficult for you to remove mold toxins on your own, all right? Keep in mind, everyone that has an abnormal HLA-DR test does not necessarily manifest the problem, all right? So having the genetic predisposition does not mean you actually get the problem. And that's one mistake that Dr. Shoemaker makes, okay? He automatically assumes if you have the genetic predisposition that you probably have the problem if some of the other blood tests that he suggests that you do are abnormal. And the other blood tests that Dr. Shoemaker suggests you do include things like C4A, uh, TGF beta-1, um, VEGF, um, VIP. Uh, there's a whole host of them, okay? And these are all chemical indicators of inflammation, all right? And so these inflammatory markers may be elevated if you have mold toxins, but here's what Dr. Shoemaker doesn't get, and he gets wrong. These chemical inflammation markers may also be elevated if you have chronic Lyme disease, okay? So Dr. Shoemaker ignores chronic Lyme disease, and he automatically assumes that when he tests somebody that has an abnormal HLDR, and they have elevated uh, inflammation markers, that it must be because they have mold toxins trapped in them. Now, mind you, he never advocates testing to see if the mold toxins are really in you, okay? All right, so number one problem I have with Dr. Shoemaker is you really should do a test to see are the mold toxins in you. Don't rely on inflammatory markers, especially if you have Lyme and especially um, because Lyme could trigger the same issues, okay? All right, so if to see if you really have mold toxin illness, do not rely on HLA-DR testing and do not rely on all those shoemaker inflammatory tests. The way to really see if you have a problem is see if you are um, excreting, peeing out large amounts of mold toxins. If you are peeing them out, that means you've got a lot of them built up in your bloodstream, all right? So I advocate doing a urine mycotoxin test to see if you have this problem through real-time labs or Great Plain labs. And these days, my favorite is real-time labs. I think it's more accurate. The more I work with both of these, I think it has more accuracy, okay? All right, all right, so that's one thing, okay? Now, in Dr. Shoemaker's 
theory, um, what he does is if somebody um, has multoxin illness based on abnormal HLA-DR genetic prototype and based on elevated inflammatory testing, he will then spend a month or two trying to pull multoxins out using binders like cholesteramine, okay? So they bind up the toxins in the intestines so they don't get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, and then that's supposed to take care of inflammation. And what Dr. Shoemaker then says is, gosh, if you're still inflamed after we've done two months of removing multoxins, it must mean there's something else inflaming you, all right? And what he, what he starts looking for then, the second step in his protocol is, look to see if you have an infection in your nose called Marcons, okay? Marcon stands for methicillin reactive coagulase negative staph infection. All right, that's what Marcon stands for. And so he is, he, because he's discovered that some people have Marcons and they have ongoing inflammation, he just assumed that it must be the Marcons causing it. But that's where he's wrong again. Because I have spent years, or one time I spent a number of years treating everyone for Marcons and I never found any difference in their inflammatory markers when they had Lyme, because it's actually probably Lyme causing their inflammatory markers to be elevated. All right, so using BEG nose spray, BEG includes something called Bactroban, which is an antibiotic, EDTA, which is a, um, a chelating agent that can pull heavy metals out of biofilms that cover Marcons to break them down, and G stands for gentamicin, another antibiotic. So basically, BEG nose spray is antibiotic, not antifungal. It's antibiotic, not anti-mold. It's antibiotic, okay? It's antibacterial. And it's used, presumably, to kill the marcons in your nose. Does it work? Rarely. <laughs> and do the antibiotics that he suggests, using rifampin to go with that, work? Rarely. What you find in treating uh, Marcons is that when you, you, you would do use the Beg nose spray, it's hard to get rid of the Marcons, even if you use Marcon with, um, Rifampin with it. And even if you do get rid of it, it doesn't seem to make any difference. And if, and if you do get rid of it, it comes back. <laughs> and the reason it comes back is it probably is just a normal thing that lives in our noses, all right? So finding an infection does not mean it causes your problems. And as I've worked with his theories and, and work with Lyme disease, I do not believe that Marcon's is something we should be treating for two reasons. I don't think it actually triggers the inflammation. He thinks it does. And number two, it's practically impossible to get rid of. All right. So I don't advocate doing it and I wouldn't do it. Um, all right. So the second part of your question is throbbing of the extremities typical for Lyme and co-infections. So it, it is a symptom that's common in a lot of people that have Lyme and co-infections. Also, it can occur in uh, mold toxicity as well, too. And the reason it can occur in mold toxicity and also occur in Lyme and co-infections is when you have these germs in you, or if you have mold toxins in you, your white blood cells are going to try to get rid of them. And they manufacture a bunch of chemicals called cytokines, okay? And cytokines are the inflammation chemical. Those cytokines are good in that they're supposed to be turning the immune system on to deal with the problem. But if the immune system's not doing a good job, it's going to try harder and harder, and eventually it makes too many cytokines. And too many cytokines make you hurt, give you brain fog, uh, make it difficult to think, um, interfere with how your hormones work, um, <laughs> give you, excuse me, um, give you bad fatigue, um, what we call Lyme symptoms, and what we call mold toxin symptoms, and actually what we call yeast overgrowth symptoms in the intestines, they all have a common thread. That is, they are all syndromes of too many cytokines, all right? So they're syndromes of too many cytokines, or cytokine excess, I should say. And yeah, lamb, leg cramping and pain would be a manifestation of that as well too, okay? So um, so the typical strategies to lower cytokines would should take care of that. Number one, treat the underlying infection or mold toxins if they're there. Number two, use anti-inflammatory herbs to help lower those cytokines. So my favorite for um, dealing with excess cytokines is liposomal curcumin, which is a, a curcumin truly microscopically wrapped in fat. And that is um, um, 
Uh, and you, that's the reason it's liposomal is you want curcumin is difficult to absorb unless it is microscopically wrapped in fat. Curcumin, which is a component of turmeric, gets inside of your white blood cells and, and limits cytokine production. Okay. So it's a way of lowering cytokines, 500 milligrams, three times a day. The other thing I like to do as part of that strategy is also, if people are having a bad time, is also use um, liposomal glutathione. And glutathione um, is a very strong antioxidant. And what it can do in terms of cytokines is white blood cells are triggered to make extra cytokines. One of the triggers is to a lot of extra oxidizing agents caused by having infections in you. And so what the liposomal glutathione does is it blocks the, um, it lowers these oxidizing agents so that the white blood cells are not as trigger happy, if you will, at making um, the cytokines, okay? The product I like for that is a product made by Research Nutritionals, which is called TriFortify. There's a TriFortify orange, there's a TriFortify watermelon, and um, I usually have people take a teaspoonful one time a day on that, okay? All right. So anyhow, those are my thoughts for you, Lawrence. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Anna. Let's see, I'm desperate to get a COVID-19 vaccine. 69 on low-dose naltrexone for Lyme and autoimmune. Have low immune system CD57. Concerned about MRI uh, vaccine issues that can occur with some autoimmune patients. Any thoughts on which COVID vaccine would be better for this situation? How can those two conditions, low immune and overactive, coexist? Thank you for your help. All right. So, so they actually they do coexist, and so um, although. So when you have chronic infection in you, it's going to trigger excess cytokines to be made, okay? And so that's um, kind of overactive, but it's because the immune system is trying to get rid of these germs. The CD57 is one type of immune cell that's made by the immune system. And it is low in some chronic infections, also in chronic Lyme. That does not mean all parts of your immune system have been turned off. It is just this one chemical, one, I'm sorry, one type of white blood cell that's turned off. So they can't exist together, okay? In situations like this, and I've been working with a lot of my patients getting COVID vaccines. I, first of all, I do advocate getting the COVID vaccine. And what I am seeing in my practice, even in a situation like yours, is it doesn't matter whether it is the mRNA or it's the Johnson & Johnson, any of them stand a good chance of helping you to prevent dying from COVID and from getting sick enough, you'll be hospitalized from COVID or from having long-term complications of having COVID. So get it for all of those reasons, okay? It is possible that anyone, whether they have COVID, I'm sorry, have Lyme or don't have Lyme, have a picture like you have or don't have a picture like you, that they may have some flare up in cytokine related symptoms after the vaccine because the vaccine is gonna trigger cytokines to be made because those cytokines are gonna be triggered by the vaccine so that the immune system turns on to fight COVID, not fight Lyme, not fight your tissues, not fight you, but fight COVID. And those increased cytokines may make you give, give you uh, a few days or even up to a week of achiness, more fatigue, and um, maybe even flu-like symptoms, maybe even a temperature, but that does not mean it's a bad thing or that you flared up your Lyme or are triggering another autoimmune illness, okay? So my recommendation is take whichever vaccine you can get. I find no difference in terms of whether people react, whether it's the Johnson & Johnson or whether it is the one of the mRNA uh, vaccines as well too, okay? All right, um, good luck to you, Anna. Hello, Brenda. Let's say hello, Dr. Ross. Have you heard of using ivermectin to treat Lyme disease and to prevent COVID-19? Thanks for your help. So um, ivermectin, everyone, is an is designed as an antiparasitic agent. 
Um, so it's designed to kill parasites. It is not designed to treat bacteria. All right. Lyme is a bacteria. All right. There is research showing, though, that it actually has antiviral properties. And especially with COVID-19, it appears to interfere with an enzyme um, that regulates replication of the germ. All right. So there is no evidence at all that it does anything for Lyme. I know a number of my colleagues try it. And I know that uh, judging by the questions I've been getting over the last couple months, for some reason, the idea of using ivermectin for Lyme is one of the current um, it treatments of the seasons on the discussion boards and among people that have Lyme. Uh, and, and we see this. I mean, every year there's some some treatment that everyone migrates to and wants to try based upon somebody's opinion that it might make a difference. But I will tell you, and in the current one of this season is ivermectin, unfortunately. So um, first of all, in terms of it treating the Lyme germ, I don't think it helps at all. And there's no evidence that it would. Can it treat intestinal parasites? Yes. There is another theory spinning around out there that says that everyone with Lyme must have parasite infections in their bloodstream and that ivermectin would help with that. And I would say there is no evidence of that, and I disagree. Can it help with COVID? It's interesting. There's science out there. there the science that we have about it helping with COVID is, I would say, very poor at best, and it's full of potential biases. All right. So our best research science that we have is something called a double-blind randomized controlled study. And that is where you take a group of people and you give them ivermectin. And you take another group of people and you give them a sugar pill that looks like ivermectin. And neither one of these people groups know that they're getting the active ingredient or not, okay? In addition, the people collecting information about them as to how they respond don't know who got what either, okay? All right? And that's because we don't want people getting these medicines to have a certain bias and what they think is happening to them, and also the researchers to have a certain bias, okay? The trouble with ivermectin is the majority of studies that have been done out there all have huge biases and that people know they're getting it and the researchers know who got it. It's still at, at open as to whether it might make a difference. There is some science that says it might, but the problem is it's very poor quality science as I just described. I am using it though, because, because it may give benefit. I have been using it in my COVID treatment protocols for people that have got COVID um, and they're in the early stages of it, or I am using it as a preventive in people that have been exposed to COVID, all right? Um, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'll show you an article where you can look at how to do that, okay? All right, so yeah, that's that's how I've been using it. I, I don't agree with using it to treat the Lyme germ. I don't agree with it to use it to treat the so-called parasites that people think they have in their bloodstream with Lyme. And I'm using the word so-called because there is no science at all that says you have parasites in your blood because you have Lyme, all right? It, I think it's just, I think it's a hogwash idea to be honest with you. And, uh, but it, ivermectin can be good for intestinal parasites and it also can maybe, and I use the word maybe, effective in treating um, um, COVID, but um, I don't know for sure if that's accurate or not because the science just isn't that good. There's some science that says maybe, and there's some science that says maybe not, okay? So let me show you my article about using it for COVID though, if you wanna give that a try. All right, so this is my website. And um, so we'll just write ivermectin in here. And this is my article on how do you prevent as well as treat COVID-19. And down here, deep within the text, I talk about ivermectin and I even lay out approaches on how you can use it, okay? So take a look down in this article, you'll have to read through it. And there's a number of other things I recommend in here in terms of preventing uh, COVID-19 as well too, okay? 
All right, so I just have to one other point to make about this. So the anti-vaxxers that are out there that are coming up with all kinds of what I think are ridiculous ideas about why not to get the COVID vaccine um, are using the idea that we don't need to get vaccinated because ivermectin, it, we have an effective treatment. And I would say to them, prove it. We really do not know ivermectin works. It is not a proven remedy. It may help. But boy, given the only treatment we have out there that actually has been proven to make a difference in health status of people with COVID or, or in this COVID um, um, uh, problem and um, um, pandemic that we have is the vaccine. That is the only thing that has been shown to decrease mortality, decrease hospitalizations, keep people from having long-term complications. That is the only treatment that has been shown, proven through double-blind randomized controlled studies to make a difference. That's it. That's the only one. And I think that's what we should be doing. Anyhow, <laughs> I expect I'm going to get all these anti-vaccine emails after the webinar, but uh, I just want to let you know my opinion on that. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Brenda. Hello, David. Let's see. Cambabesia, Bartonella, Borrelia, Elevate C4A levels. I believe Lyme can, and we are having our home tested for mold tomorrow. My lab course C4A level came back at 858. My wife level, also a Lyme patient with co-infection, came back at 1077. We just sent out our urine samples to Great Plains for mold testing, but takes three weeks to get results back. Thoughts? Thanks for all you do for us. You're welcome. So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Shoemaker has been able to show that C4A, which stands for complement type 4A or complement 4A, can be elevated in people with mold toxicity. Okay, so that's one condition that can cause them to be elevated. What are, what are complements? What is this thing called complement 4A? Well, complements are a, a system that are used um, to actually fight infections, okay, or to fight mold, basically. So they're part of the immune system. They're an immune system uh, protein, I, I think they're technically proteins, that are used to fight infection. They're different than antibodies, and they're different than white blood cells going in and eating up or gobbling up a germ, okay? They're a, a, like a third way that we fight infections in a sense, all right? And it's uh, and, and mold. And so C4A can be elevated in mold toxin illness, but it also can be elevated in Lyme, in, excuse me, Lyme infection. We, um, I have not seen a relationship with Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Mycoplasma, HHV6, Epstein-Barr virus, Cytomegalovirus, any of those other things that some people call co-infections or I even call co-infections that we don't see that those are elevate C4A. So if you have an elevated C4A, it is most likely from either mold toxins or chronic Lyme infection or both. All right, that's how I, that, that's how I usually look at it, okay? All right, good luck to you, David. Thanks for that question. Hello, LM. Do you have any special instructions for individuals who are also fighting cancer in addition to Lyme? Um, no, I don't, um, because the idea of cancer is a broad field. So there's many kinds of cancer and there's Lyme. Um, I know that um, Dr. Neil Spector, who is a um, medical doctor that uh, had Lyme himself and also had heart disease and died last year, from his heart disease, which was probably caused by Lyme. Um, he did do some research showing a linkage, I believe with um, that Lyme may increase the, the, the incidence of, uh, I think it was breast cancer that he was able to show, but he did not make, it was only one specific kind of cancer. I think it was either breast, I think it was breast cancer. Now, don't hold me, I may be quote, remembering that wrong, but there was one kind of cancer that he showed and I believe it was breast cancer. But we don't have adequate science showing that Lyme triggers other types of cancer. It might, but
but it might not. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. But um, so the only thing I would say is if you have cancer, keep treating your Lyme in case it is uh, something that's triggering it. But beyond that, I don't have any other uh, insights for you on that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you for that question, LM. Good luck to you. Hello, Thomas. Let's see. Is there anything that can be done for significant uh, anhedonia? Uh, anhedonia? Um, a lack of feeling, everyone. Um, you know, so if I see somebody with that, I'm thinking possibly Bartonella. Um, so I want to make sure to, to see is there Bartonella there or not. And if it is, I want to treat for it. Okay. In addition, there are some psychiatric medications that might help but when it's severe, I'm usually going to get a psychiatrist involved to help. And frankly, I don't, I don't know the best medication for that. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I would have to wind up looking it up. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Thomas. Hello, Melissa. Let's see. Hello. I am newly diagnosed as of September, January with Lyme. I have been on Doxy, Macaroni, and now Zithromax for a month, and my symptoms have not changed. Where do I go from here? So, So, Melissa, I'm not sure what you meant by macaroni. I'm trying to figure out what um, antibiotic might be similar in name to that, um, unless you mean malarone, maybe. Malarone starts with an M, and we can use to treat a Babesia co-infection. All right. So, um, Melissa, I, it's, I, I'm not going to be able to answer your question. There's a lot of uh, factors that I would need to ask you about so that I could figure out the best response here, okay? But I'm gonna just give you a global idea. So first of all, when you treat Lyme, um, it can off, if you have chronic Lyme, if it's Lyme that's been in you for at least a year or more, it can sometimes take a year or more before you're gonna get well. I'm sorry to say that, okay? In fact, if we look at studies about just having Lyme infection, not having one of the what we call the co-infections, but just the Lyme infection, um, there's been a study that was not published on that was presented at one of the annual ILADS meetings, um, the International Lyme Associated Disease Society meetings about, gosh, I think maybe this is about 10 years ago now almost. And in the study, people were put on both clorithromycin and metronidazole. Clorithromycin treats the spirochete form of Lyme um, inside and outside of cells, and also the uh, metronidazole would be useful for treating what we call the cyst form of Lyme, okay? So they were put on those two antibiotics and they were treated and they were watched to see how quickly they turned a corner. And what the studies showed is that by three months, 30% of people started to improve, okay? That means by three months, 70% of people noted no improvements, all right? Uh, by six months, 60% of people started to have some improvements. And by nine months, 90% of people started having some improvements. Okay, so first of all, the reason you may not be noticing anything yet is it, it you haven't been treated long enough. It takes time to turn the corner. Okay, number two, when we treat Lyme, we recognize that there are both um, spirochete forms of the germ. That's the thing that looks like a corkscrew. All right. And that there also are um, cyst forms of the germ. And we need to treat for both forms of the germ. So uh, the uh, doxy and the zithromax are very useful at treating spirochete forms of the germ that live inside of cells and outside of cells. Um, but I don't see anything here that you've done that treats cyst. So you would want to treat cyst. Things that treat cyst can be um, grapefruit seed extract is something that treats cyst. Um, tinidazole, metronidazole treats cyst. Something called rifampin can treat cyst. Okay, so one of the reasons you may not be getting better is you haven't treated cyst. Okay, all right. 
The other thing that could be getting in your way is if you have a co-infection. So when a tick gives you Lyme, it might give you some other infections. And those other infections can be a parasite called Babesia, can be another bacteria infection called Bartonella. Um, you could also have some called Anaplasma or Ehrlichia. Those are other infections. And those all need to be dealt with too. Now, the Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, if you have it, if you've been on doxycycline for at least two to four weeks, you probably have cleared those out, okay? Um, the uh, Bartonella, if you have it, would not have been adequately treated. Again, I, I don't know what macaroni is. Maybe you meant metronidazole by that, I, which would treat cysts. But um, typically, treatments that treat Bartonella are going to involve using two intracellular antibiotics. So it could be a doxycycline or a minocycline paired with an azithromycin or a clarithromycin taken at the same time or with a Bactrim or with a rifampin, okay? So I don't see that that's been done here, but I don't know if you got Bartonella. I would need to ask you questions to figure out, do you have Bartonella? And the other thing is, if you happen to have Babesia, I don't think unless that, if that macaroni is really called malarone, which it could be, then Doxy with malarone and Zithromax with malarone can get rid of Babesia, but you need to use the malarone for at least four to five months <laughs> to be able to get rid of Babesia. So uh, there's a lot of factors here. I would need to ask a lot of questions to figure out which germs are there and are you treating all of them? And are you treating with the drugs that cover all forms of the germs, okay? So let me do, some, I'm gonna do a screen share so you can look at some information to try to get some more information for yourself on this, all right? So let's see here. All right, so you wanna answer, start by answering the question. Oops, I guess I got rid of that. You want to start by asking yourself the question, what germs should I be treating, okay? So take a look at my how to diagnose section here in my Treat Lyme information site. And in my article called How to Diagnose Bartonella, I go over the symptoms that make you think a Bartonella should be there, okay? Um, take a look at that, okay? In my article called How to Diagnose Babesia, I walk you through the symptoms that make you wonder if Babesia should be there, okay? If you have enough symptoms of Babesia or you have enough symptoms of Bartonella, you should be treating them, okay? All right, then, in terms of how do you treat these things, take a look at my infection treatment plan section here. And in terms of what do you, what, how do you address the Lyme infection, take a look at this article, uh, which is my herbal and prescription Lyme disease antibiotics article, okay? And in here, I talk about how you're gonna build a treatment to cover the different forms of the germ. Up here at the top, I say combine antibiotics to treat all forms of the germ, okay? Rule two, combine antibiotics that treat Lyme living inside and outside of yourselves, all right? All right, and then down here, just so you have an idea, I describe some of the antibiotics, but all the way here in this third, well, actually, yeah, down here in this, third section, I talk about how do you put it together? What combinations would treat Lyme inside, outside of cells and get at the spirochete and the cyst forms of the germ? Okay, so take a look at that. All right. Then in terms of how do you treat uh, Bartonella, would, how would you build a treatment for that if you think you have it? Take a look at my article called Kills Bartonella. And for Babesia, take it the one look at this one called Kills Babesia, okay? So you need to figure out what's missing. Have you Are you treating all the infections you have? And to do that, you first need to start and figure out, do you have um, um, all of these infections or which infections do you have? Okay, all right. Um, Raz, I think I my screen share didn't work. <laughs> Let me, let me go through this one more time. I see that I got out of my screen share there. Let's see here. All right, let me do this again. All right, so up here, uh, this will be real quick. This is my Lyme guide. In terms of figuring out how you treat Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia, look in this section called Infection Treatment Plans. You'll see articles that target each of those infections. And in terms of figuring out how do you know if you have Babesia or Bartonella, click on this link here, which is gonna bring you to a bunch of articles that I've written about. How do you diagnose Babesia? How do you diagnose Bartonella? Okay, all right. All right, 
Good luck to you, Melissa. Hello, Nicole. Let's see, my doctor did a CD57 test on me to check for Lyme since my other Lyme panel from the regular lab showed nothing Lyme related. My CD57 is very low, below 20. She said due to this, she believes it's Lyme. Is CD57 alone an accurate diagnosis for Lyme? Um, are there other things that can cause low CD57? I also have SIBO, Candida, and Hashimoto's. Okay, so in my opinion, I don't think it's adequate to make a Lyme diagnosis. Um, CD57, again, is a specific type of white blood cell that can be low in people that have Lyme about 80% of the time. We do know for sure that one virus infection also causes it to be low, which is HIV. There's studies that say HIV, uh, the AIDS virus, can cause CD57 to be low. And I'm not saying you have HIV, okay, but I'm, I'm just saying that's another infection that can cause it to be low. And it is possible that other chronic virus infections might also cause it to be low. So it is not a way of diagnosing Lyme, all right? If your um, regular lab testing for Lyme was negative, the next best way to figure out if you have Lyme is actually to get a test through Igenix. Igenix is a lab that does tick-borne testing. They're based out of California. You just get a test kit from them. And then the testing I like, they have a lot of tests that they do for tick-borne, a lot of varieties, I should say. But they developed about two or three years ago now, they developed a test technique that they validated, and they've got good validation studies showing that it can detect Lyme when it's there, and it doesn't overdiagnose Lyme. And that test technique is something called the Lyme immunoblot. Not the Western blot, but the immunoblot. And what they're doing with the immunoblot is they're looking to see, does your immune system make antibodies against proteins found on eight different kinds of Lyme germ, okay? So eight kinds. That's different than the regular LabCorp Quest kind of blood testing for Lyme because they're looking to see if you have antibodies against one kind of Lyme germ, okay? So you already see what the big problem is, all right? And in fact, the Lyme germ that they're testing you to see if you have antibodies against was the original kind of Lyme found in the 70s out in Lyme, Connecticut, all right? And guess what? The world has evolved and so has the Lyme germ, <laughs> all right? So it makes no sense that we're still real testing only for one kind of Lyme infection and making all these determinations that somebody doesn't have Lyme based on those tests. So Igenix has gone a lot further and they now have this test that looks to see if you have Lyme against eight kinds of Lyme germs. And in addition, what they are doing with their test is they're using, um, the way they run the test is they take proteins from these eight kinds of Lyme germs. And then they have figured out a way of genetically modifying them in the lab to remove parts of the proteins that might hold on to antibodies from made against viruses, not against Lyme. And if they happen to hold on in the test, if they hold on to these other antibodies, they could give a false test, okay? a false result. But by stripping out these parts of the proteins that might um, attract uh, antibodies made against chronic virus infections, they remove the possibility of a positive Lyme test actually being a false positive test, okay? So based on validation studies that Igenix has done where they took samples of blood of people known to have a variety of Lyme germs, or I'm sorry, samples of blood that had a variety of Lyme germs, and also samples that did not have Lyme, they looked to see how good is their test at detecting Lyme. And they found that it can find Lyme when present 95% of the time, right? And when it finds it, its chances of being a false positive because they use these clean proteins is 0%, all right? So that's a good test, okay? Now, if you look at the standard Lyme testing that is done by regular labs, their ability to find Lyme is only 50 to 65%. So if you wanna see if you have Lyme from a testing standpoint, get the Lyme, the Igenix immunoblot test um, using the Igenix test kit, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Nicole.
Hello, James. Other than saunas, are there any other machines, devices, or gizmos that you have found effective for chronic Lyme? Um, good question. Um, so you may have heard of something called Rife machines. Rife machines are machines that use electromagnetic frequencies that in theory are supposed to vibrate the covering of the germ and burst it. Okay. Um, I do not recommend Rife machines, but I have had people use them in my practice, and I find that people get about um, about 35% or so of people that do Rife machines find benefit in doing them, okay? Now, I will also tell you that, that even though that's what I see in my practice, there has been some research validating that success rate as well, too. And that is, um, uh, there's a group called um, LymeDisease.org, based out of California, that is conducting an ongoing uh, project called My Lyme Data, where they um, people enroll by answering a bunch of questions, and eventually they use their responses just like smaller groups of people to do studies. Okay, and they selected uh, a group of people about two years ago where they asked them. Have you used alternative therapies? Um, and if so, did they work? And did they have side effects? And in their study, I believe they showed, I think it's 40% of people that use Rife machines have gotten some benefit from it, okay? So that's one thing, maybe, maybe it does some germ killing. There's no science that proves it, but maybe it does, all right? Second thing that, um, that may give some benefit that I've seen in my practice is there is a device called a Beamer, um, B-E-M-E-R, that the unfortunate thing is it's uh, basically sold through a pyramid scheme, <laughs> which I don't like those as pyramid marketing schemes basically, but it um, can change, um, alter blood flow into the tissues using electromagnetic frequencies in theory, that's how it works. And I have had some people get improvements with sleep and body pains using that as well too, okay? Those are just about it. I, I'm not seeing any other gizmos make big differences, at least in what I'm seeing in my practice, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, James. Oh, let me just do a quick screen share here because I, I just alluded to that article that um, reviews what works and what doesn't work in terms of alternative therapies. And I just want to show you how to find that. So, um, I'm just gonna write the word in my search bar up here, alternative. And that will pull up this article here called What Works, Lyme Prescription and Alternative Medicines, okay? And in here, I review the findings of two of the LymeDisease.org studies. But what they did show is that you have the best chance of getting well by using prescription antibiotics. That was one of their findings, okay? But then it, further down here, there's a table from their studies that looked at the success rates of doing different things, okay? And Rife machines actually in their study, 35% of people got benefit by doing them, okay? Um, there's another category here called electromagnetic energy therapy. I'm not sure whether that means beamers or not. I can't tell from this. I, I don't know whether it does or not. Anyhow, you can look through here and see what, how, what people find successful. I would point out that stem cell therapy that was all the rage and everyone was rushing to do this uh, about two years ago only helps about 3% of people, okay? All right, so let's go back here. All right, thanks for that question, James. Good luck to you. Hello, Terry. All three of my kids have tested positive for Lyme and BART, but none have symptoms. Would you advise treating them? Um, no, I would not. Um, and let me try to explain why. So when you say they test positive, that means you've got a testing, probably antibody testing, um, that either it was in something called an IFA or a Western blot or an ELISA test. All of those are tests measuring to see, um, or actually immunoblot, Western blot, ELISA, or even something called an Ellispot. These are all tests that show, are you having an immune reaction 
against these infections. It doesn't prove whether the germs are still in you or not. It is very possible that the immune system is able to get rid of Lyme and Bartonella on its own. Possible, okay? The other possibility is that the immune system um, is able to deal with these infections by um, kind of locking them off or keeping them under control and they don't cause you any problems, all right? So we can have infections in us, but those infections don't necessarily give us dis-ease or disease because our immune systems either wipe them out or control them. So for instance, there, there's a lot of healthy people walking around out there that have monovirus in them, Epstein-Barr virus. If we were to pull uh, 100 healthy people off the street, we'd probably find laboratory evidence of elevated antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus. But guess what? The majority of them, or well, actually since these were healthy people we pulled off the street, they're all healthy. And so having antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that they're sick from it. It means the immune system is doing what it's supposed to do, which is keeping them under control, okay? Now, the risk that we have when we use antibiotics, we should only use antibiotics to make somebody feel better. Because if we use them in the case of Lyme and Bart, like you're describing, let's just say the germs are in your children, but they're healthy right now because their immune systems are working great, either got rid of them or keeping them under control. If you use antimicrobials, you run the risk of the germ um, becoming resistant and maybe becoming more virulent, stronger, and now they got a disease when they didn't even have a disease before, okay? So you gotta be careful about using antibiotics. We do, I use a lot of antibiotics in my practice. I use a lot of antibiotic herbs in my practice. But I do so carefully, and I only do it when I rec um, by um, to help change somebody's health that's not doing well. I use it to get them healthier, and I admit there's a risk that I may create a stronger germ by doing it. But what I have found over time is the majority of people get great benefit by using herbal or prescription antibiotics, and I acknowledge there may be a risk that we may could create a greater problem for them, and I discuss that with them. Okay, so we don't wanna just throw antibiotics at somebody that's healthy. We wanna give antibiotics for good reason because there's risk in using antibiotics. One is maybe we make a stronger germ. Number two, we disturb the good bacteria in the gut that provide directions to the immune system to work well, okay? So we could create disturbances that way too. So we have to be careful about that. Okay, thanks for your question, Terry. Hello, Karen. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thanks for your knowledge. You're welcome. Let's see. I've been getting a lot of info on ivermectin for preventing and treating COVID, as well as nitric oxide nasal spray that was recently approved for sale in New Zealand and Israel. So, Karen, I had already thought, so I shared with you earlier the article that I wrote about COVID or about ivermectin. And I talked about that, so I'm not going to address that here. Frank, I don't know about the nitric oxide nasal spray. I haven't seen any science on that. Um, as to whether it is beneficial or not, I, I don't know. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, good luck to you. Karen, if you missed my discussion on ivermectin, go to my treatlime.net website. And um, while you're there, just write the word ivermectin in, and you will be drawn to my COVID-19 article where I talk about how to use it in COVID-19 prevention and or treatment. But as I described earlier, I don't know for sure it works or not. The science on the one hand says it might, but on the other hand, it is very full of bias because it was um, very poor quality studies that have been done to date. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that question. Hello, Lynn. Let's see. I have some questions about Houtonia, Sita, Okuda, Cascal, Toba Bark, and Oregano Oil. Do they need to be separated from probiotics and by how much time? 
And is it necessary to take the tinctures on an empty stomach? Two, do I need to discontinue them prior to getting the COVID-19 vaccine uh, since they all appear to have some cytokine inhibiting activity? Number three, a doctor once told me that oregano can be hard on the gut. I take probiotics, but is there anything you recommend to protect, repair the gut lining? Okay, so so first of all, everyone, so um, we go, I'm going to answer this question. So cat's conotoba, many of you may know, I find to be very effective at treating the Lyme infection. And there's even some more recent research showing that cat's claw, in addition to treating um, growing Lyme, may even treat persister Lyme, okay? So persister being Lyme germs that go into hibernation and ignore the irregular antibiotics that we throw against them, all right? Um, I find that cat's claw combined with Otoba work about 85 to 90% of the time to help 85 to 90% of people, I should say, okay? All right, Siddha Akuda and Hutania are two herbs that I like to use to treat Bartonella. And I find that used together, they can be effective in 70 to 75% of people, okay? Oregano oil, I am using based on research that was published by Johns Hopkins University over the last few years, looking at what do we use to treat persister forms of Lyme and persister forms of Bartonella? So let me just talk about that. So historically, most of our treatments have been designed to target what are known as growing forms of Bartonella and growing forms of Lyme. But more recent research in the last four years is telling us that some of these growing forms convert into hibernating forms, which we call persisters. Uh, they're also known as stationary forms. Or the, and, and, um, and so these persisters basically are germs that basically slow their metabolism way down and they ignore all the antibiotics we throw at them, okay? So the hunt has been on trying to figure out what do we use for them? And so uh, Dr. Ying Zhang in his lab at Johns Hopkins University has been able to show us that uh, things like oregano, clove, and cinnamon oil are good at treating these persisters in Lyme and Bartonella. And more recently, there's some studies came in, coming out of that lab that also show that cat's claw may treat persister Lyme and that cryptolepis that we historically have used to treat Babesia may also treat growing and persister Lyme as well too. The only thing though that his lab has been done that show that herbal is herbal that treats persister Bartonella is the oregano oil, clove, or cinnamon oils. And they also, those oils also help with Lyme, okay? So to deal with persister Bartonella, you gotta use one of these oils, whether it's a cinnamon, clove, uh, oregano, or a combination of cinnamon, clove, oregano, or oregano by itself. That's how you go after persisters, all right? So let's see, in terms of timing of these, you can take them all together. Um, you do not want to take them with probiotics. I usually try to have people take their um, tinctures in the morning and at nighttime. And somewhere in the middle of the day, as far away from your herbal antibiotics is when you would take your probiotics, okay? So to answer that question, all right. Um, it is more ideal to take them on an empty stomach, but I usually have people take it with food because sometimes these things can be irritating and I still see a good benefit from doing it. In terms of um, oregano hurting the stomach, it can. It can be kind of caustic at times. If I have patients that are having a hard time with it, I usually will have them chew um, licorice tablets um, about 15 minutes before they take the oregano oil capsules. Licorice, when you chew it, um, uh, there would be a form of licorice called deglycerated licorice, or also known as DGL. If you chew DGL tablets, your saliva and chemicals in the licorice mix together to form a microscopic gelatinous coating of the food pipe and of your stomach to act as a protective barrier, okay? It does not inhibit or decrease absorption of these medicines in the intestine, so, all right? So you would chew two tablets about 15 minutes before you take them, and um, that often will do a great job at helping and limiting and stopping any stomach upset from the oregano, okay? Now, in terms of stopping these before the COVID vaccine, the anti-cytokine properties that any of these may have is marginal, limited, minuscule at best. You can stay on these as you're moving forward and getting your COVID vaccine, okay? All right.
Thanks for that comment uh, and question, Lynn. Good luck to you. Hello, Ethel. Let's see, is there a cure for Lyme other than a protracted treatment with multiple powerful antibiotics, which adversely affect the immune system? So Ethel, the answer is, unfortunately, probably not. Um, I showed you earlier that article that I've written that uh, was based on data from um, LymeDisease.org. And again, they're my Lyme data project. And what they showed is that the people that had the greatest chance of getting well 80% of them had used long-term antibiotics of a year or longer. That means 20% probably got better using something else, but the majority of people do require antibiotics. And yes, there is a risk of injuring the multi or the um, microbiome of the gut, the good bacteria and germs that make up the gut, but you have to weigh that against the risk of having Lyme run rampant and hurting you. And it's not a perfect, uh, pair, um, it's, it's a difficult situation to be put in to think that to get over this terrible thing called Lyme, that you also have to do some injury to the good microbiome in your gut. But there, uh, for about 80% of people, there is no other way, unfortunately. And what my Lyme data actually showed is what I see in my practice is that on average to recover from chronic active Lyme is a year or more of using these various antimicrobials. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Thanks for your question, Ethel. Oh, hold on here a minute. Hi, Tammy. I'll be with you in just a second here. All right, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for hosting these webinars. You're welcome. Do you know if wildcraft herbs test for heavy metals, pesticides, and other microbial contaminants? I tried to locate their website to find information, but wasn't able to find anything. I found a website that stated they are temporarily closed, but I'm not sure if it is the same company. So, Tammy, um, they are using wildcrafted herbs. However, they are not testing against any of these, so I cannot certify that they are free of all these things that you ask about. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question. Hello, David. Let's see. Can't. Oh, wait, I answered that one earlier for you. Hello, Claire. Let's see, I've been treating a revisit of Lyme for two months and I still have severe shoulder pain, almost useless arms. Treatment is doxycycline and dementia and banderol plus chondroitin, glucosamine. How long before I see improvement? Thanks. Um, so, if somebody has a Lyme relapse, generally what I will see is if you're on a treatment that is working and if it truly is a Lyme relapse, usually you're talking around two to six months of treatment to get well. Okay, that's what I see. If you're two months in and you're not getting any improvement, um, either you're not using the right antibiotics or it's not a relapse and there may be something else going on. So I would encourage you to talk with your doctors and say, my shoulder pain is getting better. Could it be something else? Should I see an orthopedist? Should I look elsewhere? Okay. So I would, I, would, I would consider that. To give you better advice, I would need to ask you a lot of questions. I'm just giving you a general response. I would need to ask you a lot of questions to find out more about what other symptoms are going on besides that shoulder pain that you're having. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Clara.
Hello, Melissa. The brain fog and lack of concentration is the worst and has been. How, where do I start? Which protocol first? So, um, Melissa, I, 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 it's hard to say. Um, it all depends on what your infections are. And so, um, Melissa, here's what I'm going to propose. I'm, you, I see that you also wrote down, um, you responded again and said you're on Malaron and not macaroni. <laughs> That's good to know. I wondered if it was Malaron. For, for me to give you the best advice, uh, what I would suggest you might want to take a look at is my consult service where I can visit with you online and try to get review your situation and try to come up with some ideas for you. Uh, let me do a quick screen share here to show that to you. All right, so through my um, Lyme information site, click on my clinic tab here, which brings you over to my practice, which is Marty Ross MD Healing Arts, okay? Take a look at my appointments page, and you'll see that I offer two different classes of visits, all right? One is something I call full medical service, and the other one is called limited consult service. I give you detailed descriptions of both of those options down here, okay? Essentially, the difference between the two is, is with the full medical service, I can prescribe for you and I can order test. But in return for me doing that, you will eventually need to see me in my office once we all come out of COVID-19 lockdown which probably will begin sometime in September. I'm gonna start requiring that at least one or two visits a year be in person in my office once we come out of the COVID-19 lockdown, okay? All right. Or you could do the limited consult service, which uh, we do we could do online, but you will never have to come out here and see me, but you will have to find somebody to do the prescriptions or to implement the recommendations that I have as part of that, okay? Read through each of these. I describe uh, the visit length. They're a little bit different from both. I talk about the fees. They're a little bit different from both. And then take a look at the required forms. They're a little bit different from both and see which one of these would work for you or if you are interested in doing it, okay? If you are interested, then you just click on the book now button and get one of them set up, okay? Good luck to you, Melissa. Hi, Margaret. See, please speak about oxalates. I keep mine to a minimum. Boy, Margaret, I'm sorry. I just, I'm not, I don't consider myself to have much expertise in it. I know that there are some people that tend to have high oxalates that can be inflammatory and that the way to treat it is to basically avoid sources of oxalates. Um, beyond that, I'm not the greatest expert to talk with you about it. All right. Sorry about that. Hello, Joyce. So, see, I'm Dr. Ross. Diagnosed 20 years ago, Lyme, doxy for four weeks, many symptoms over the years, but no doctor could help. In 2016, got very sick, diagnosed with Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella. Got Babesia under control, currently on Cat's Claw, Banderol, Sida Okuda, and Houtania. Uh, ramped up slowly until 30 drops each, two times a day in December 2020. Started having muscle pain, which worsened after two falls in October and November. Have been to a shoulder surgeon, chiropractor, primary care, and scheduled with a neurologist and rheumatologist. 
no doctor ever put the pieces together, just look at the body as separate parts. Can you suggest a specific kind of doctor to help? I have tried everything you have suggested. My shoulders and arms are the worst with intense pain, 24 seven, any hope. Thank you as always. All right, Joyce, I am so sorry to hear where things are for you. Um, couple thoughts for you that you might wanna look at. Um, so for ongoing pain that could be musculoskeletal or neurologic, um, acupuncture sometimes can make a big difference. And so you might wanna look at getting acupuncture. You need to give it a minimum of four to six visits to see if it's gonna make a difference for you, okay? Um, in terms of acupuncture, there are two general styles out there. There's something called Japanese style acupuncture and there's Chinese um, style acupuncture. In Japanese style, they both use needles, but in, Jacupun in, in uh, Japanese style acupuncture, the needles are inserted just into the skin and not into the muscle. That makes it a little bit easier to tolerate for some people, okay? But that's an option to consider. Another option to consider would be to see a, a type of physician specialist that is called a PMR doctor. The letter P, the letter M is in Marty, and R is in Ross, a PMR doctor, okay? And that stands for Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. They're kind of the medical doctors of physical therapy and um, manual therapies to help somebody. All right, so they, could look at you and figure out a way of rehabbing and helping using things like physical therapy and other modalities to try to get some of this pain under control. So those are some thoughts for you to look at in addition to continuing to treat your infections as well too. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Joyce. Hello, Lynn. Let's see. Do you have a protocol to take supplements to help the body deal with inflammation or any downside risk of COVID vaccine? Separately, do you have any protocol to recommend for lungs in a 20-year-old who had a spontaneous pneumothorax to build body back up to help prevent recurrence? So the answer is no, I don't have anything on um, pneumothorax, nor do I have any ideas for you on that one. In terms of inflammation post-COVID vaccine, I would try not to do anything to limit it. Let me talk about that. So um, when you get the COVID vaccine, it's going to trigger white, so the, whether it's the mRNA vaccines or the Johnson & Johnson, ultimately what's gonna happen is your cells are gonna start producing um, and displaying this spike protein found in the coronavirus. And your immune system is going to see that as something foreign, which is good. We want the immune system to see it as something foreign. Some of the white blood cells are going to start manufacturing chemicals called cytokines, okay? And if, as you know, for the world of Lyme, all of your symptoms are too many cytokines, all right? Because the, the immune system also, when it sees Lyme, makes cytokines too. But these cytokines are, the intention of these cytokines is to turn on your white blood cells, to draw them to where these spike proteins are, and to get them to start um, seeing them as a foreign uh, foreigner so that they turn on to fight the real coronavirus in the future, all right? Now, the maximum effect of the coronavirus vaccine is two weeks out after the dose. My recommendation is not to do anything that limits cytokines during those two weeks. You want your immune system to be turned on by those cytokines. And so that may mean you are gonna be more tired, you are gonna be achy, and you may have brain fog for a few days in and around the vaccine. You want that. That it means the vaccine is working and programming your immune system to, affect, to tr attack the real attacker of COVID-19 if you should be exposed in the future, okay? All right. Thanks for your question, Lane, and good luck to you, and good luck to your son. Hello, Christine. Uh, brand new tonight. Blood work is... Oh, you're brand new here tonight. Well, welcome. 
Let's see. You're, and you're going to be the last question of the evening, too. How do you like that? Um, blood work is showing less concentration of Borrelia and acute higher concentration of tularemia. History of being on penicillin for 15 years after childhood rheumatic fever. And, uh-oh, uh-oh, we may not have the rest of your question. Ah, here we go. I'm going to, uh, you, you, you rewrote it as a longer question. Let me try it again. Here we go. Brand new tonight, blood work showing bands of Borrelia, but more acute and concentrated is tularemia. History of penicillin for 15 years after childhood rheumatic fever, then had a uh, superbug in 2018, uh, or E. coli superbug in 2018. Doxycycline took it out, but crushed me. I am seeking to heal without any antibiotics. I am allergic to many classes of antibiotics and resistant to most as well. Infectious disease doctor has made clear antibiotics to be avoided as much as possible. Also have recent Epstein-Barr markers. Can I treat all? Can I do this with tularemia? So you can treat the Lyme using herbal antibiotics. Um, and, and for options on that, take a look at my article on a Lyme disease antibiotic guide where I describe Lyme herbal antibiotics in there as well, too. And my two favorites for that would be the Atoba bark and cat's claw that I mentioned here a couple times tonight, okay? But in terms of tularemia, I'm not aware if there's a way to do that with herbal antibiotics or not. I, I haven't had to look into that with my patients before, and I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I would have to investigate that further and figure it out. And so I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to do it without doing prescription antibiotics or not, okay? All right, sorry about that, Christine. Thanks for showing up here and asking a question though. All right. All right, everyone. Um, that is it for me for tonight. Um, it's five. It's 5.30 p.m. Seattle time and the Basinjis are getting restless. So I I'm gonna need to get them out here. I also need to get myself out and walked and I need to get some exercise in for myself this evening too. Um, I will be editing up the video later tonight. And uh, tomorrow morning, I'll spend some time writing up a summary of what we talked about before we get that email sent out to you announcing that the video is ready. If you all are finding benefit in these webinars, I'd appreciate if you would share that with others who could get benefit as well. Let them know what we're doing here. You can do that by forwarding the email tomorrow morning that has links to that will have links to sign up for next week's, as well as information they can use to help um, uh, see the video from tonight as well, too. Okay, so share the information. Share the wealth, everyone, okay? and uh, But it's been good being here with you all tonight. I look forward to, to seeing you again next week and sign up for next week as well, too, when you get that email tomorrow. So um, good night, everyone.